Oh, BookTube. I have a totally gratuitous Wednesday reads for you. <laughs> or Wednesday TBR torture, however you want to look at it. Just an occasion for us to talk about even more books. Uh, new books, of course, since that's most of what I do on this channel. Although, ye gods, <laughs> the response that I'm still getting <clears throat> from one of my videos yesterday. You people absolutely love it when I go used book shopping. I don't know why that is. <laughs> oh, most of these books are brand new to you, too. Is it just that used books you have a chance of finding yourself for a quarter? Or I, I don't know what it is, but uh, I might have to do more of it. <laughs> I might have to go used book shopping at least once a week. I don't usually do that anymore. And I don't think you would either if you had 15 books coming to your front doorstep every day. <clears throat> but that's for a uh, subject for another time. For right now, we'll do a Wednesday Reads. I've got six books to show you, three of which I've already read, and three of which I will be getting to right away. Uh, so the, the first of the ones that I've already read is wonderful. It is a chatty, indispensable piece of Star Trek lore. If you are a Star Trek fan, you have to have this book. This is uh, the 50-year mission, and this is the first volume in this series. This is the first 25 years. So there we have the Holy Trinity of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. And this is an oral history of Star Trek. So it's it's got... A, bits and pieces depositions from absolutely everybody from the regular writers to the occasional writers to the actors to the directors uh the producers just fantastic just fantastic you never think of star trek the same way again you'll learn so much from this book i did i learned a huge amount from this and i thought i knew a lot about star trek to begin with going in including behind the camera uh there's another volume there's a volume uh i think at least one more volume if not maybe there's just one other volume that's the second 25 years um uh, i'm assuming that'll come out in paperback soon too but this one of course this is my star trek this is the real star trek and it's incredible just incredible incredibly entertaining and fascinating stuff uh to <laughs> to use a loaded star trek word well, the next one uh won't take you very long to read <laughs> it's a children's book it's a tiny board book, it's a picture book, and even with tiny board book picture books, books that are obviously for very, very preliterate children, uh, tiny little children, even there, I found that I have to watch, I have to study the book to see if there are political messages being smuggled in, being smuggled into these children's books uh, that are not, they don't belong there, and they, they uh, oftentimes the, <clears throat> the political dog whistling is so overt that it, it, it makes the book distasteful where I, I i don't even know where uh there'll be a, a tiny little tadpole and the tadpole is going through its tadpole life with its frog parents and the tadpole decides that it <clears throat> identifies as an eagle chick not a tadpole and Maybe Father Frog doesn't understand, but Mother Frog does. You have to be who you who you are on the inside, and uh, and the tadpole grows up and wants everybody to call it an eagle <laughs> or stuff like that. It, stuff like that. It, there, it it doesn't so much go into board books, but it's getting younger and younger. But uh, and I have to confess, there is an element in this book that I do not understand. Uh, it's this is, it is a baby bear. It's by uh, it's written and it's drawn beautifully by Kadir Nelson. And it is a, a children's picture book in which a baby bear uh, is lost. And look at look at the artwork there. Look at how beautiful that is. He he's lost and he wanders through the woods, asking various kinds of animals if they can tell him where his home is, if they can help him to get home. Uh, and uh, the ending of the book. Uh, it pulls a, a dipsy, uh, the usual kind of feel-good, uh, you know, uh, what Daniel Dennett refers to as a deepity, <laughs> where uh, a, a sort of a gnomic utterance that's made to sound profound, but that actually doesn't mean much, or that means nothing at all. Uh, there is no adult bear in this book. Baby Bear is on his own, and he's wandering from animal to animal to animal, trying to find his home. And a little bit of it confused me, uh, because that's not typical. Unless, unless some sort of enormous tragedy has befallen the mother bear, she would usually take care of baby bear until he's much older than this. <laughs> uh, and it takes a lot. Uh, it takes an enormous tragedy to get rid of. A mother bear is just about the most frightening animal in anywhere in the North American continent. So, so, uh, but it's lovely. 
and I, a couple of the messages that it that it has buried in its text are really good ones. Like, for instance, uh, asking for help and the ability to find wisdom from all kinds of people, not just your own kind of people, and the ability to talk with people on their own terms. A lot, a lot of that was very good. So I, I, I enjoyed it uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, it's not really going to matter anyway. It's not like... Uh, it's not like, you know, a, a kid who's old enough to read on their own is going to want to read this. <laughs> it's the sort of thing you'll read to them. And they will ooh and ah at the pictures, which are beautiful. Uh, then the next one uh, that I have read, the last of the three that I have read, surprised me. Uh, I knew that it was coming out. I read it in um, an hour. Uh, and I was kind of expecting, I don't know why, but I was kind of expecting that it would be uh, rounded off, that it would be sanded edges. And it isn't. Instead, it's very clipped, very brutal, and I liked it quite a bit. It's by Tom Brokaw, the legendary newsman Tom Brokaw. Uh, and it's called The Fall of Richard Nixon. A reporter remembers Watergate. Uh, and there we have not only Richard Nixon, but also a very young Tom Brokaw. And uh, this is the, what Brokaw remembers from the fall of Nixon. And this is, what is this out? I didn't even check when I was reading it. Uh, the very end of, our, of uh, October. Uh, and fascinating. Really, really valuable that, that someone like Brokaw would write a book like this and that it would be so sharp. Uh, obviously. Obviously it's written with an eye cocked towards the president towards the, the present day and, and the current American president who, like Nixon, is facing an impeachment. He, the, the House of Representatives will almost certainly vote to impeach and send articles of impeachment to the Senate. And then it'll be up to the Senate what they do. It'll be up to the Senate whether or not they hold a trial at all. I, my guess is that Mitch McConnell will, will uh, void out the trial, that he won't even bother to have it held. Uh, but if he has it held, he will do it solely for the benefit of the president. He'll do it solely for the benefit of vindicating Trump on national TV. Uh, that's my read of the situation now. I, I can't imagine. The, the reason that Nixon resigned is because he knew that he would be impeached. He knew that he'd be removed from office in the Senate. He knew that the senators, the Republican senators in the Senate, would vote to remove him. He had very few friends in that body. Uh, and he had uh, mainly the fanatical support of a very embittered and small base group uh, uh, of voters and a lot of uh, Watergate watchers I was one of them myself every day two editions of the paper at least every day a lot of Watergate watchers thought well he the Senate won't won't convict him or they won't have the trial or whatever instead a delegation of Republican senators went to Nixon and said look we've seen the evidence against you and if this comes to us we're not going to put our own political lives on the line by by vindicating you, we're, we're, we will remove you from office. If the, based on this evidence, we will remove you from office. And uh, naturally, the, the question that hovers over this book, any book like this, is: Is there any chance at all that the supine and bootlicking Republican Cong uh, Senate today would even consider doing that to Donald Trump, when Trump has confessed to impeachable crimes on camera, in front of the world? on the lawn of the White House. He's confessed in writing, he's confessed in front of cameras multiple times, so have all of his cat's paws. He's at least as guilty as Nixon was, and he's guilty of a lot worse things <laughs> than what Nixon was. Nixon's, Nixon's crimes were all internal. He wasn't selling out the country. He wasn't suborning uh, international policy uh, for his own sake and for his own dollar. Uh, th those crimes are much, much worse, but the question is, in 2019 is would the Senate ever even consider doing that I know one uh, I don't know Tom Brokaw but I know one very old very seasoned political uh, hack political uh, savant an observer who's been observing presidents forever just forever uh, and who knew some of them uh, and worked with some presidential candidates and some very important senators over the years and according to him what Republican senators say behind the scenes is that th this would be a near-run thing, that, that you need a two-thirds vote. And behind the scenes, Republican senators say, yeah, there are some die-hard loyalists, but this gets worse and worse every day. This looks terrible, and we have to justify ourselves, not only to our constituents, but to history. So it's not a foregone conclusion. Uh, I believe it when I see it, <laughs> but one way or another, that's what—that's the environment for a book like this. And I, was, I guess that's part of the reason why I was expecting that it would be kind of a soft shoe thing, and it's not. It's not. Instead, it's a—it's a 
a really good book, really, and, and takes you like that to read. Uh, and then we'll do the three the three books that I haven't read yet. They're, these are immediately on the launch pad. Uh, the first one is by Georgie Baylor. I think it's her debut. It's The Other Windsor Girl. <laughs> Not The Other Boleyn Girl, but The Other Windsor Girl. It's about Princess Margaret. This is a novel about Princess Margaret. The uh, feisty younger sister of Queen Elizabeth II. This is a a historical novel about her. I think it would be it will be the third such novel that I have read, maybe the second. Don't know anything about the author, uh, and I just I'm trembling with dread at the idea of this story. I, Princess Margaret is typically drastically misunderstood by the people who write about her, either in fiction or in nonfiction, or who do you know bloviating documentaries about her. So we shall see. <laughs> we shall see. Uh, I'm always uh, up for a book on the Windsors anyway, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So I, and this comes out uh, as a paperback original uh, in early November. So in a couple of weeks. Yeah, this is going to be. Oh wow, this is going to be. Uh, okay, this is going to be a sixteen dollar paperback. So if you like your historical fiction recent and you like books on the Windsors, this is going to be stacked in your bookstores. Uh, then the next one is Natural History. Uh, just full dress natural history and I, I love those kinds of books with a study of African elephants or the bumblebee or whatever and this is by Adele Brand and it's a study of the fox the hidden world of the fox uh, this comes out in uh, November I believe no uh, in a week this comes out on October 22nd uh, and that's all that it is that's plenty that it's uh, it's a natural history of the fox uh, what it does, how it does what it does, what it eats. Uh, the, I'm sure that the author's emphasis will be on the fact that foxes have melded so well into urban and suburban living, far better than most other kinds of, of uh, animals. They are thriving, even though they live in cities. I guarantee, no matter where you live, you live near a fox. Uh, there's there's at least one breeding pair in the, in the Arboretum, just two minutes away from where Frida and I live, we come across their sign all the time when we're out in the woods. <laughs> There's at least one breeding pair there. Uh, but probably all over as well, probably elsewhere as well. There are woods and, and dells and streams all over the place here. You don't have to go to a big park to find them. And that's all that a fox needs. That They need a small amount of denning. No one traps them or, or hunts them in Massachusetts, so you're, you know, they're perfectly safe. Uh, but I'll be interested to see. I'm hoping that it's done with a good deal of lyricism. That's the kind I like in my uh, in my uh, natural history. And then the next book, the last book, the the one that I haven't read, the third one that I haven't read, is that that Rara Avis. It's that it's that uh, that poor to be pitied thing. A December new release uh, in the Western book market, especially in America, I would think. Uh, books that come out in December. I mean, but in December, most of your book coverage staff at most major book coverage outlets are looking towards their vacation. They're not seriously down in the trenches reviewing books. They're looking towards their vacation. They're doing big gift guide selections. They're doing uh, usually their year-end roundups of looking back at the whole year. I will be doing such a thing myself. I do the greatest of all such roundups. Uh, on. I do it for my literary blog, Steve Reed, which exists now on Open Letters Review. So in, in December, in the month of December, you will get 15 or 16 different categories. The top 10 re releases for the, the year 2019 in all the categories that I read and love. And it's a, it's a literary event not to be missed. I don't usually unironically toot my own horn, but there is nothing like the Steve Reed's year-end list. Oh, there are all sorts of things that are sort of rough approximations of it. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, uh, Entertainment Weekly, I'm sure, will do such a thing. Um, and and Kirkus Reviews and Bookseller and all that. But those are all done by committee. Those are all done by large groups of people. And uh, uh, mine is not. Mine is, mine is done by one person. There is no need for me to, uh, to kowtow to a consensus. There is no need for me to take votes of any kind. And you all know how I read. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know how I got on this. Oh, right. Uh, December releases. I am considering books all the way up until December. And then... There's nothing I can do. Even I am hamstrung by the season. Uh, so the first 15 or 16 or 17 days of December, I will still be at my post. I will still be on duty. But it will be to deliver those those uh, year-end lists. It won't be really to do new releases. I'll see if I can once in a while. But uh, but like everybody else, I will be shutting down the whole uh, the whole apparatus. And then you know the idea with at major newspapers and magazines is to 
stir it all back up again in January. So new releases that come out in mid or late December are orphan children. They're, they're, it's hard to get attention for them, and this is one of them. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen with here, because I, this, is, this is out already in the UK, but this is its American release. This is Daisy Dunn's book, The Shadow of Vesuvius. Uh, and unlike the uh, Tasha Alexander book that we saw, I think it was yesterday, that had the exact same title, this is nonfiction. This is a life of Pliny. Uh, the subtitle is A Life of Pliny. And if I remember correctly, uh, from what I read, uh, the reviews that I read of this in UK book reviews, uh, the title is meant to be nonspecific, because this is kind of a life of both Plinys. Pliny the Elder and his nephew, Pliny the Younger, uh, both of whom are notable figures in Roman history. So... I don't know, maybe this will just be Pliny the Younger with lots and lots of digressions at the beginning to Pliny the Elder. Uh, well, one way or another, uh, this comes out in December. This comes out in, uh, do we have a date? This poor, poor thing? <laughs> this is from Liverite, who I love. Uh, do we have a date for this thing? almost don't want to know. Uh, no, we don't. Uh, no, it's just December. It doesn't give a date. Uh, well... I will try to get to it, and, and of course the, the best way possible for it to be for me to cover it in December would be if it's so good that it ends up on my biography list for, for 2019. I am intentionally keeping spots open on all of those lists uh, to, you know, for, because I'm going to be reading right to the end. So, so there you go. That is a little bit of a Wednesday reads. Uh, we've got The Shadow of Vesuvius. This is coming out in December. Those of you who are Roman history fans probably don't want to miss it. Uh, it'll be in bookstores still in January when you get back from your holidays. Then The Hidden World of the Fox. A uh, slim work of natural history, just a straight-up natural history work about the fox. Uh, then The Other Windsor Girl, a historical novel coming out as a paperback original uh, about Princess Margaret. Uh, then uh, The Fall of Richard Nixon by Tom Brokaw, uh, which is a, a bare-knuckled look at, at Watergate. Uh, then Baby Bear, a children's board book, very much to be uh, to be chewed on and thrown around about a wandering baby bear who has to find his home, uh, and lastly uh, the fifty year mission, uh, the first twenty five years. This is an oral history of Star Trek, uh, which will be out in uh, in paperback. Uh, what have we got here? Early November. This will be out in paperback in early November. So if you have a Star Trek fan on your list, and they don't have this book already. It's perfectly time for you to give it to them for, for the holidays. Uh, so there you go. That is a Wednesday Reads. I will wrap this up for now, but I will be back. <laughs> Thank you, Book 2.